I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. Tom, would you like to introduce our guest today? Absolutely. These are longtime friends and guests of Creek Devil. We've got Lisa and Norma with us today and they've got some updates and we're always thrilled to have them on the show. Uh, before we get going, I just want to say if you like the show, you know what to do. Uh, click the like and subscribe if you haven't subscribed. It helps the algorithm. And if you want to support the show, you can do that. with. Uh, we've got a link to Patreon and the YouTube. So with that said, um, who do I hand the mic off to? Who wants to start, Lisa or, or Norma? Uh, I, I guess I will. Because All right. uh, lots happened since I spoke with you guys last. Okay. I uh, I moved from the northern Catskills um, to the southern Adirondacks. Missed my group. Um, about a week after moving, there was a sighting just up the road that made the papers of one of the members of my group. Um, there was a Bigfoot sighting at the Dollar General, believe it or not. Um in South Cara, where I used to live, which I missed, but it uh, made all the papers down there. Really? And uh, yeah, so, yeah. Give us some details. Fill us in a little bit on that. Well, I guess some employees were having their smoking breakout back, and there in the wood line, out steps a Bigfoot. And I believe three people saw it, and uh, it made the papers and scared a lot of people, but. Uh, Unfortunately, I never got to see an adult one of my group, just the juvenile. And, uh, yeah, pretty exciting. Wish I was there. And uh, after I moved up here, had a, a very busy summer, so I got a late start. And October came around, and I said, I better start looking for a group, you know, with my recorders, you know, try to find something. So, um, of course, I picked uh, the most far out location I could there's a reservoir that's off limits to people not too far from me and um, goes up a dirt road that's only maintained in the summer so I thought it would be the perfect place to go up in there and um, looked around till I found some sign I put out a recorder and I did get indeed what sounded like um, Bigfoot sounds on the recording the problem being the area was so vast that keeping track and trying to have the audio recorder in the right place at the right time just didn't seem to work out. And I'd have to go deeper in the woods and it would get creepy and <laughs> it, it just wasn't worth the effort. So if you remember the group I had down South for six years that I uh, followed, um, they were in an area of woods that was surrounded on all four sides by roads. And I thought that was kind of an anomaly. Well, I decided to try the same thing, and I went on Google Earth, and I'm at the very bottom tip of Lake Sakandaga, which is a very long man-made lake that stretches north. And um, I found an area, a pocket of woods off the main road where the, the road looped around, and there was only about four houses on the road. And I went in there, and the sign was unbelievable. I saw all kinds of tree breaks. It was it just looked like Bigfoot heaven. So I put my recorder out <clears throat> and I went out the next day and they ripped the, the branch right off the tree. And I don't know what they did with it. There was a swamp back there, but I'm sure it's swimming with the uh, fishes, as they say. And um, so that was a little alarming. So I went out and I put it back out in a slightly different area. And um, what I got was, was quite amazing from the start just like down south they um put a sentry a juvenile i think at the recorder the whole night long and this group you could hear off in the background 
and I'm guessing it's the alpha, but I would get constant roaring on the recorder, sometimes scary loud. So I started thinking, is this a group I really want to, you know, follow and start camping out with? So that never happened, but um, I recorded them up until last week, and um, every night they're right at the recorder. I get sounds. I get um, uh, it's a pretty funny century. He did this crazy owl call. Sounded like a, a guy doing it, a, a 600-pound man screaming into the recorder at the beginning of a barred owl call, and then trying to recover at the end of it and it sounded pretty hilarious. And, uh, then one day I got him, he must've taken a stick and, uh, I decided it was windy one night. So the recorder was hitting the tree. So I set it out further out on a branch and I guess he didn't like it. And he took a stick and for about an hour, he was beating the ground all, all around this recorder. And I found evidence of it the next day when I went out. I found a big branch, and all the all the leaves were disturbed in a circle around the uh, recorder. Wait, let me so let me was... back up. I, I apologize, Lisa. Um, no. So you you had the recorder in one location, and you all you did was move it to a slightly different one or a much different location, or what? What was no, the deal? No, um, thanks. There's about a half a mile stretch of road on the very back end of the woods, um, the lake on one side. And um, it's it's just the deepest area of forest. If you go in far enough, you hit a swamp and um, a ton of beaver activity, fresh beaver activity, but no beavers. So I don't know if they've uh, made meals of the beavers or, or what, but there's all kinds of fresh trees down and um you know of course with all the mud i was looking for footprints and only found partials nothing really of interest um but there are no beavers back there anymore so i just moved it down maybe uh, 150 feet just just to just slightly different um i was originally near the swamp when they uh i guess they didn't like it and they ripped it off the uh it was off one of their main trails i think and they just ripped the whole branch right off the tree and re- well, took the recorder a, with it. Here's a thought, and um, I think, Will, I'll, I'll get your input on this, but, you know, we don't realize just how much we're under observation. So, yeah, they may have seen it after the fact, or they may have watched you move it. I don't know. Well, you know, what's interesting is on the recorder, when I put it out, I'm only about 150 yards, 200 yards off the road where I put it. So it it takes me maybe 30 seconds to walk out. Without fail, there is someone at something at the recorder in no more than a minute on all my recordings. So I feel I know I must be being watched, which I find very interesting. To say the least. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all right. And I, I apologize. I keep interrupting you, but you, you no, got me fascinated a little bit. I want to go back just, just a moment. Hold your thought on where we're at. But I want to go back to this publication. Is the publication that talked about a Bigfoot sighting, was it like a local newspaper or was it a publication just for a Bigfoot group? Oh, no, this was the local newspaper it made. Really? A relatively you, good-sized newspaper, yeah. Did you keep a copy of it? I never got a copy of it because I was up here. Oh, okay. But um, okay. Someone, someone, sent me a, someone sent me a photo of it, that's all. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. So mainstream media yeah. picking up on this. Yeah, okay. right, picking up on Bigfoot. Yeah, and okay. there was no, you know, none of your typical... Um, tongue in cheek, you know, along with the story either. It was it was done as if it was a very credible event. Wow. It kind of goes it's back better. to the mid seventies and sixties, how it used to be right. reported. Oh, that's exactly. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. So I'll, I'll let you pick up where we left off, but I just wanted to get that. That's interesting. Yeah. And I, I had a question for Will because um, the constant, um, now the roaring I'm getting on it, they're, they're a little ways off. They're not at the recorder. There's just the one individual always at the recorder every night. It, it, it seems like it's the same individual by its actions. Um, I have on occasion put apples out in, in a different location. I'm, I'm not a big gifter or a believer in gifting or anything like that. But um, just to show that I, I come in peace, I mean no harm. Um, I leave out a couple apples every now and then. And once again, on the second to last recording I got, um, I had some apples in the fridge. I said, oh, let me take some apples out. And um, the recorder, I got it eating the apple and then urinating. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of interesting. But the roaring that goes on and almost like a talking, you can almost hear like um, a softer feminine in the distance and then this much deeper one. And there's some pretty loud roars on it. And I don't know who they're directed at. I don't know if they're directed at me or the, the fact that I have the recorder out there, um, or, or what's going on. I, I actually did knock on a couple doors. There's only a few houses on the road, and no, nobody's, you know, they've claimed to have heard coyotes, which I've never recorded back there. So I don't know if they're mistaking coyotes for what's going on. Um, the, wo- the one woman who said, oh, we hear coyotes and it sounds like ladies screaming and it scares her. She sw- said she just moved up here from the city. So I didn't, I didn't want to interject and say, well, <laughs> you're probably not hearing coyotes. Yeah, that's not a coyote. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I didn't want to scare her. So. Well, why not? Yeah, hey, you got Bigfoot in the backyard. <laughs> you, you, usually what I do is I, I, I blame it on the uh, the faux neighbors that, that, that hear howling and stuff. <clears throat> Just to say, I, you know, I ask if they have heard any odd noises at night, any loud, strange noises. That's usually how I uh, start yeah. off the... Um, so if we get some barred owls out here, they're about eight or nine hundred pounds. Have you heard them? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, except for the woman that that's hearing ladies scream, she said, and uh, she believed they were coyotes, but um, I, I didn't want to uh, say anything. <laughs> right. Tell her no. They're they're more like seven feet tall and uh, a lot bigger than coyotes. Coyotes avoid them like the plague if they can. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. that's yeah, fascinating. I've, I've never gotten coyotes on all the recordings that have been out there for two over two months now. So. Well, coyotes don't sound like women screaming either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, where she is is a little too far from my recorder for me to pick that up. I don't have anything similar to ladies, women screaming, but I do have those really deep roars that um, I never recorded down south in the Catskills. As I have no idea what that's about, but it's, it's quite frequent on the recordings. You know, sometimes, Any ideas, guys? sometimes you get them that just, that just in the areas they call them, you know, the screamer. Uh, like in the Puyallup back in the early 70s, they had the Puyallup Screamer. And and it's interesting, uh, I just got a message from a, a guy just a couple days ago up in the area back, you know, for anybody who remembers me talking about the um, the bear carcass that we found, something you never find in nature with its, with its exactly. face smashed in. Uh, just really? in the same area, this guy recorded a Screamer. And it was just going on really? and on. And in fact, we're going to have him on the show, and we're, we're going to play that audio that he recorded. But uh, oh wow! But sometimes they do that. I mean, if it's not close to where you are, like in your case or his, um, and it's unknown reasons why they do it. They're just out there. They they vocalize. They'll do it a lot. Um, you've got the sentry nearby, so you know that's kind of on the boundary of their area. So 
Uh, if they were up close doing it to you, then it might be directed at you, but off in the distance, no. Yeah. I've often thought of, um, I, I've looked it up on Google Earth, and there's, there's many ways I can access that area. And I've often thought of going on the opposite side of the swamp where the sounds are coming from and putting out recorders there and seeing what, what I get. But then I'll, I'd have to park on a main highway and, you know, be seen walking in. It's all, it's all public lands where I am. It's not posted. It's, you know, they have little fragments that are part of the park. I'm at the very southern tip of the uh, actual park. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird that I'm finding them exactly in the same type of location that I did down south. And, um what I plan on doing with the remaining recorders that I do have is um, I've gone on um, Google Earth and I've identified other areas like that that are surrounded, you know, s smaller um, areas of woods surrounded by roads, um, some on one side near the lake, some on the other side, and seeing if that pattern holds up where I put another recorder out in, in an area surrounded by roads um, instead of, you know, trying to go out into the wilderness and, you know, hunt and peck for them, you know, try to find a group. So that that's going to be my research for next year is to find out, you know, try to identify how many groups are in. I'm going to start with a 15-mile radius and work out from there and see how many groups, you know, I, I'm really curious about the density of their population, you know, how close together there are groups, how many groups are in a, you know, such and such square mile radius. So uh, that I'm really curious to find out. So that that's my plan for next spring is to start putting them out. Maybe, uh, 10 miles apart in the circle. I've located oh, four plan. nice properties, four nice properties I've identified that I can access where I won't be trespassing. So that I'm very curious to find out. Well, Lisa, this very is interesting. interesting. Very, very interesting. I, I, I'm just, I'm still riveted by the fact that a local newspaper published this yeah and and it wasn't tongue-in-cheek so that's, that's no, very not well, at Tom, all. it really depends yep. that depends on the editor or you know who's putting the stuff together because uh sure. if you get an editor like i knew one in camas washington many years ago who was very interested in the subject so whenever something would come along that's the way he would present it it was never anything goofy i contacted your friend gail there on the other side of the river from for me and uh she found the listing and in fact we, we plan to meet up sometime um to compare notes but um she was able to obtain the information herself too i think she's from i think uh hudson valley bigfoot researchers maybe yeah i think that's her uh her site yeah, Gail, yeah. gail's good yeah yeah, Gail B., she's got a uh, Facebook page, too. She's got a lot of good photographs on it, too. She's got some actual sightings where she's gotten some pretty good photographs, which is something as yet I've not been able to do. I've just not been able to get close enough to an individual. You know, I've tried sitting out, you know, for long periods of time or, you know, just quietly sitting or... But... Um, if if it was that easy, everyone would see Bigfoot, right? Well, I don't know, Lisa. It sounds like you're getting <laughs> a lot of activity there. Yeah, I was I was surprised that you know the very first spot I tried that you know fit the parameters of my last group. You know, I haven't gotten one night's recording that had nothing on it. Everything has something on it. In fact. I was just, you, you remember the audio problems I had last year. Well, I, I was finally able to fix them, and I finally have all my recordings on my computer now. So um, once I get them loaded up into Audacity, I'm going to send you guys the clips um, that I just described to you. The ear, the ear-splitting roar and then the, um, 
the one where he sounds like he's screaming a barred owl into the right into the recorder. It's pretty oh, cool. Oh, yeah, but no, we can't wait. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Woman who cuts my hair, she has a small salon in her home. Her husband is a hunting guide and a taxidermist. And I was speaking to him, oh, middle of October. That time I got those recordings. Unfortunately, um, he has a tremendous hearing loss, so um, he couldn't hear the recordings that well off the recorder, but his wife could. And um, at that time, hunting season up here in the northern tier starts about a month earlier than where I used to live. And he says that a lot of people, a lot of hunters were getting Bigfoot pictures on their uh, trail cams, which I, um, I'm i trying to follow up on and see if, you know, through him, I can get a hold of any of these people, you know, who have, who have mentioned to him, <clears throat> excuse me, that they've uh, captured some odd things and specifically mentioned Bigfoot. So now that yeah. would be interesting. Well, it would. And again, it's, it's, um, you, know, you just have a tremendous amount of activity up there. Uh, and I'm looking at the map here. It looks like uh, you're just west of Vermont. And that whole area is just riddled with, it looks like somebody took a shotgun. There's just lakes and creeks and ponds all over the place. Oh, yeah. It's a totally different environment than the Catskills. It's it's much more, the woods are much more dense. They're, they're much more wet. There's a lot more uh, lakes and streams and springs and... Um, yeah, very different environment. It took me a while to get used to, you know, finding places that I could even get through physically. <laughs> it's it's that dense in some areas. So, yeah, I I tend to think there's there the population is going to be higher up here. I'm going to have more luck, more success than, you know, down below where I was only able to locate one group. And not only whether or not I locate another group, but the similar whether or not there are similarities and how they react to the recorders and, you know, because he goes, you know, he's done everything from banging it to breathing on it to whacking the ground around it to screaming into it. You know, he's <laughs> he's run the gamut of uh, he's finally OK with it, which is, is good and not good because, you know, the. The amount of activity, you know, he's he's actually wandering around more, trying to catch things that squeak in the night. It seems <laughs> you you hear when you hear. Uh, we don't have any gray squirrels up here, which is odd. We used to have a lot of gray squirrels. We have red squirrels up here. I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but um, they really bark. You know, an alarm. They're very vocal when. Uh, when anything comes around, and especially oh yeah, they no, they they, they make a racket. Yeah, the little yeah, fox, we call them fox squirrels, and then the gray squirrels tend to be either in the higher elevations or, or more in the more piney woods, that sort of yeah. thing. I've actually seen um, some black squirrels here, which are a variation of the gray squirrel, but down you know south of the park. Um, once you get in, it's it's all these small red squirrels, the uh, fox ones I think are a little bigger than the um, traditional red squirrel, but they're still, um, they're much more vocal than the grays. And, you know, you can, when they're, when they're barking, there's something there. And, yeah. um, and I can hear him chasing them around and, you know, sticks breaking and goes tearing off in one direction and you hear all this screeching and <laughs> it's pretty entertaining actually. You know, I would think I so. Yeah. What I wouldn't give to be, it's the next best thing to being a fly on the wall. You know, it's when I first discovered recording them, you know, it's one thing to constantly go out and look for signs and this and that. But when you, um, that's only so satisfying to me, you know, you, you, the chance of running into one is, is so small. So at least being able to hear them and hear their activity is I find very fascinating. And I recommend a lot of people do that, you know, put out recorders. Just, oh, absolutely. Just put, yeah. Just don't put silver, anything silver and shiny, don't put out. <laughs> they don't like. They don't like they it. Don't okay. Tend, well, yeah, they, 
they, uh, for some reason, when I paint them black, they're far less afraid of them. They're far less leery of them for some reason than silver. Oh, and that, that just reminded me of something. And um, I proved it to, to someone who went out with me. Um, have you ever heard of their uh, proclivity to liking items that are blue? And the theory behind that is, is that aside from the sky, blue is the rarest color in nature. And that's a fact. I, I researched that. And I've heard that. Without, yeah. yeah, without fail, I can be out in the middle of nowhere and I will find either blue mylar balloons, you know, not, not blown up anymore. Uh, I'll find blue beer cans, blue pieces of trash. Um, and I took someone out one day and every piece of trash we found, and this is when we went up, it's called Jackson summit. It's, it's all a wilderness area. Um, the, uh, the local government owns all the property. It's with the reservoir that, you know, you're not even allowed to walk to the reservoir, let alone be on the property. But we went up, we went up past there where there were some deer hunt. There are a lot of deer hunting camps up here. And they're only occupied in the fall. And um, so we went way out in the middle of nowhere, you know, not where people are going to be wandering off the trail and leaving trash. And it was amazing what we found, you know, quite deep in the woods. And every item was blue. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, yeah. And without fail, well, what are you? What are your thoughts on that? Have you heard that? Because we have heard about where they cache things away, human stuff. I, I haven't heard that with blue. Well, I'll have to start taking pictures because it's without fail, it's always blue. I don't know if it's them. I don't know if it's just coincidence, but. Um, Further out I go, the only garbage I find is blue. Well, someone told me that a long time ago, and I didn't know whether to believe it or not. But then, just in my wanderings, I I go off trail a lot. I'm not one to stay on a trail. I'd rather go bushwhacking and just you know follow signs rather than you know people signs. But um, right, right, I can't say. I can say the tree breaks up here are a lot bigger and um, the area where I first put my recorder out that one day where it was ripped off the tree and never found um, the destruction in that area of trees. One, one huge tree limb that was probably six inches around was ripped off a tree and it was um, blocking the actual tree that I had put the recorder on. So I found that quite fascinating maybe i really <laughs> had one po'd sasquatch out there you know aside from ripping off the branch that my recorder was on there was a lot of tree destruction in the area that wasn't there the day prior so i thought that was interesting yeah we've seen that um in in oregon last year uh i hadn't seen it before that destructive of you know the breaks and things yeah yeah i was surprised at, at um and it, and it continued actually when i stayed i'm recording on the on the opposite side now not the opposite side but further down the other side of the road and when i was originally recording um the, to the right i'll say um every time i went in there it was it looked like more and more destruction was done and it, it wasn't storm damage because we didn't have any storms it was you know october november very quiet october and november here um just north of us we got six feet of snow up in watertown we had some big lake effect snows but uh that didn't hit us wow they got 73 inches of snow yeah yeah well norma what's been but, going um, on with you uh oh, I know she's there. I'm here. There Sorry you are. about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, not quite as great as what 
you know, Lisa is talking about. But I did want to say one thing about the whole paper, uh, you know, uh, article that they had written. In, in that area of New York, is, uh, upstate New York, it, it's not so much taboo uh, to talk about Bigfoot as it is in some other places, you know, Massachusetts. Um, yeah, they, you, know, it, you go into certain places in upstate New York and, and it's like, almost like uh, uh, California, you know, Northwest California, you know, where yep. people talk about yeah, it all Bigfoot. the time. And, yep, we have life-size Bigfoot cutouts. Excuse me. <clears throat> you can throw a stone and there's another, you know, Bigfoot um, uh, store or something. <laughs> you can't find that exactly. around here. Um, we have a lot of people but it's with not... life-size Bigfoot cutouts painted black on their mm -hmm. lawns up here, which... I found interesting. <clears throat> so it doesn't surprise me that that um, the the uh, reporter or the you know editor or anything did a, a halfway decent job on that story because again, it's it's not taboo up there, you know. Here it would be people would look at me like I had two heads or something, so. They would never, they, they would never put it in the paper, I don't believe. But um, what's been happening here? Well, the last time we went out with Lisa, that was pretty amazing. And shortly after that, we went out with the uh, same area, uh, this new research area that we go to. Um, and let me preface it with, it's pretty, it, it's private. Uh, some of it is private land. The other is, um, it, it's, it's very, very densely wooded areas. Uh, and it has certain, um, oh, what do you call it? Like protections, you know, animal protections and things like that. So, we, this is the area that we go to, and I sent you, I believe, Tom, a Google snapshot of that area. And it's, like I said, it's pretty wooded. So we have been going to this place for a while. Um, after we went out with Lisa, um, I think it was about a few, a few weeks or a month after that, my cousin came up, and he's been... Bigfooting with us since he was like 12 or 13 years old and he's like 22 now um, and he came up and we went out and set our recorders out just like we do we went to the same exact place um, and we were in separate cars and he we, we gave him a recorder we had one each of us and I'll tell you there's a vast difference between the the Bigfoot in this new area than the Bigfoot that were in our our old research area. It seems to be that these guys are a little more aggressive and a, a whole lot bolder. <laughs> they don't they are they are three you know when we were in, in, in our old research area, you know, they're they're throwing pebbles pebbles at us, you know, tinging off the car. Uh, you know, doing stuff like that. Um, on occasion, you would get a larger, you know, rock. Uh, these these guys here, they are throwing pretty good sized rocks. They're not just these little, you know, pebbles. These these. Well, I was talking to Bob the other day. I said that the, the most thing that we have here in this area is rock and and water. It just seems to be rock and water. I mean, everywhere you look, there's boulders. There's, you know, back in the day when the farmers were building the, the stone walls. I mean, there's, you go out in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere woods and there's stone walls and things like that. And I'm like, you know, can there be any more rocks? I've never seen so many rocks in one concentrated area. But, and boulders, they're pretty, pretty good size. 
So these guys aren't, uh, you know, picking up little pebbles and in, in sticks and stuff and throwing them at us. They're 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 picking up some good, you know, size rocks. Well, um, Lisa had a little taste of that <laughs> when they hit the boulder behind us and just With about blew our ears out. Yeah, it was like, right. Like a fifty-pound rock hitting the boulder right behind the vehicle. It was it was loud. It was scary. It was it was about it was it, and it was about four o'clock in the morning because we were about to leave, um, and we gave ourselves a little time limit, and because uh, it kind of started to get into a little lull, and man, that thing came out of nowhere, and it was so loud, and you could also you could hear the little shards, you know, from the. I think it was the rock that they had thrown, little shards hitting the uh, ground after it hit the boulder. So that's what they're doing. And they're not quiet. I mean, they are, they're pretty vocal, except they don't vocalize really close to us. But they're in, what would you say, Lisa? It was like, I don't know, maybe like, 10 or 15 yards away from us yeah. that we were hearing, mm-hmm. you know, these, well, like you said, Tom, 800 pound, you know, barred owls. Barred that, owls, right. Yep. right. That aren't, that aren't barred owls. Um, <laughs> and, you know, just these different sounds, these howls. Um, and I don't know, it, it's, they, they make these sounds that, want to make you think it's an animal like the barred owl but when you hear it, it's like who cooks for you <laughs> you know and, and it goes up and it kind of crescendo it goes down you know and you're like yeah that's a weird owl um but they they do stuff like that so we've heard more vocalizations in this area than we did in our old area. There were vocalizations some in our old area. And I know I used to joke about them being mute, you know, back then in our old area. But they but, used to um, come closer and watch the vehicle, didn't they? Oh yeah, they were they came pretty yeah, they came pretty close. They were always um not far yeah, off. You, and you would see a lot of eye shine. I shine, you could, I mean, you could hear the steps that were so, it was so close to us um, on occasion where we would, you know, try to catch, we'd, we'd flick on the light to try to catch, see if we could catch them, you know, because they were so close. Um, but yeah, they got a whole lot closer. Well, you know, I wouldn't say they got a whole lot closer, but it's different. They were, um, I don't, I don't know. They were more subtle, I guess. These these guys in the newer area are not subtle. <laughs> they no. they are like we we are going to let you know that we are here. You know, we're going to throw things at you. And I mean, there were a couple times that we it sounded like a branch went across the top of our vehicle. When my when we were with my cousin, uh, he was in a separate car, like I said, and it sounded like something hit his car, like a branch hit his car. We were, I mean, we were out there listening to the, the stuff going on, and and again, they're they're throwing rocks and they're doing things like that, and then this the, these branches that just sailed across or I don't even know where or where they came from or what they did, you know, because again, this is omnidirectional, so it's really hard to pinpoint. Sometimes you we can using... what's that? You were using the H twos, right? The audio yeah. um intensifier. The, amp- yeah. the H twos with amplifiers, yeah. So um when the night that we went out with my cousin uh, <clears throat> we were again. We were hearing all kinds of things. I mean, they and then they they don't they come close, but then it, it it's not the only one. They there are others that are a little further out, you know. 
And I think that happened with us too, Lisa. We could hear him close, and then we could hear him a little farther out into the woods, doing oh, their little vocalization. We were further out, and we never heard the one that came up behind the car and smashed that right. that big rock. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, he, he. Uh, I'm assuming it's a he, but anyways, you know, snuck up, and I mean, I don't. That came out of nowhere. That was just bizarre. It's really cool to listen to. It was, it was amazing. Um, yeah, but this we is played stuff it back and forth. As soon as we yeah. got home, we played it about ten times over just to rehear it. It was so loud and amazing. Yeah. Well, this sort of thing was happening with um, my cousin. You know, a few a few weeks later, and we he you know he's a 22 year old, so sometimes he's gets a little antsy in his car. And he'll, he'll like turn his inside light on or he'll turn his phone on or something like that. And I'm like, turn your light off, <laughs> turn your light off. Um, but I think he had, he, when, when that tree limb came and he thought he got hit by a branch on the car, he said he was going to get out and go check it. Now, at this point, we had been out there for a while, and they were just doing all kinds of things. You know, they're, they're throwing all kinds of things, and they were making little noises. And, you know, I was like, I would get the, I would get the flashlight out, and I would look around the area. You know, put down the window, look around the area. I was getting a little frustrated, actually, <laughs> because I'm like, where are you guys? I know you're there. You know, where are you? So <clears throat> when he got, he said he was going to get out of his car and see if he had any damage to his car. Before he did that, he put his headlights on. And I said, I, oh, let me, let me go back a few seconds. Prior to him getting hit by the car, Bob said, you know, this is getting a little active. You know, this is, they're getting really close. I think they're not happy with us. Um, I think we should probably think about leaving. And so I said, well, let's just wait a little while and see what happens. And Bob is so funny. But at any rate, so that tree came and, and Bob said, see, see, <laughs> you know, he's like, they're getting, they're getting pretty angry with us being here. So he said he was going to get out, like I said, and look at his car. And he turned on his headlights. And I said, I'm going to get out too. Well, Bob had taken his, he had taken his H2 out of the window. Because at this point, after that tree uh, branch kind of hit the, his car, Bob's like, yeah, we, we got to go. I said, fine, whatever. And so he took. He took his um, H2 out of the window. He took the uh, earbuds out of his ears. And, and I said, I'm going out too. And he goes, you're going to go out there? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm going to go out there. I'm getting a little sick and tired of this. I'm going to go out there and I want to see what's going on. <laughs> you know, because this is, I'm at this point, I'm like, we've got to see something. You know, he's like, I, he's, he's, he, he almost can't talk. He's like, I can't, I can't believe you're going to go out there. You're actually going to go out there. I said, yeah, I'm going out. <laughs> so he, he goes, okay. I said, look, put your H2 back out there, put your earbuds in and listen while we're out there. So he did. And he stayed in the car. He wouldn't get out. And so my cousin and I, we got out and I had my flashlight. We had our H2 still, you know, cause you can hold them. And uh, he had his, I had mine, mine was recording. Mine was the only one that was recording. So we get out and he checks out his car and we don't see anything, we don't see any damage. And um, <clears throat> we, we just look around, we look around and I'm, you know, scanning the wood line, I'm scanning in deeper, I'm looking, you know, we're going around the cars were going a little bit away from the back end of the car. And then we go to the front and the sides. And while we were out there, they didn't do anything. Bob's like, 
you go out there, you're going to get pegged with a rock. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, well, maybe, you know, and I don't want to get, you know, hit in the head by one of the rocks that they throw. But um, at this point I was like, I'm going out because this is getting a little frustrating. So we went every, you know, we went around the cars, we went beyond the cars. We went by that boulder that, you know, got hit when, when I was with Lisa, we went down the little, um, into the, the woods a little bit on that road. Now this road is a, it's not passable by car. It's, you either have to have a all wheel drive or a four wheel drive vehicle or, you know, one of the, uh, fun vehicles there. And I'm just, we're, we're just looking and nothing is happening. Everything, you know, kind of settled down for a second. And I'm like, all right, where are you now? I said, throw something now. <laughs> and nothing, nothing. So we finally get, I said, all right, we're getting, we're getting back in the car. He gets back in the car. I get back in mine and we're sitting there again. Bob's like, are we leaving? And I said, no, let's just hang out for a little bit longer and see, you know, see if they do anything now that we're back in the car and see if they do anything. So we waited for a little bit. It took a few minutes before anything started to happen again. And then you hear a rock, you know, from the new layer, you know, this shuffling and, and more rocks would come and stuff like that. And uh, nothing, nothing major but there was, before we left, there was, uh, again, another branch of some sort that was thrown, sounded like toward our vehicle, and Bob, Bob pretty much had had enough. So I said, all right, he's, he's like, this is, this is getting to a little too much, you know, so let's, you know, let's call it a night. So we're like, okay, so we have two ways whenever we, uh, go out with other people. So um, I let my cousin know that we're going to be, you know, closing down and probably heading out. Well, he, we get our stuff going. I still have my recorder on. Bob took his off. Um, my cousin took his off and we were getting, going to start to get ready to go. And my cousin radios in and says, my car won't start. And Bob's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> He's like, no, my car won't start. And it's because he left his lights on. The whole time that we were outside of the car, he left his headlights on. And he had, he didn't have a good battery as it was that he told us after we didn't know prior to that, um, that his battery wasn't you know, all that great. So he left his lights on while we we're out there. And when he got back in the car, he shut them off. But then when we were ready to leave. His car wouldn't start. Well, Bob's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Now we have to get out of the car <laughs> and we have to jump his car. So he's, he's kind of a little nervous about that because of all the stuff that was going on around us. And we ended up, I said, Bob, it's going to be fine. So I get out of the car, uh, my cousin gets out of the car, Bob takes our, our vehicle and swings it around, you know, in front of his. He's like, while I'm doing this, I want you guys to make sure you are listening and watching <laughs> and make sure that nothing, you know, is going to sneak up on, on me or us while we're doing this. So, of course, we're, you know, scanning and doing everything. But Bob was pretty nervous when he you know, had to jump his vehicle. And finally we got his vehicle jumped and we got, you know, back into the vehicle, our vehicle, and then we left. But this is a very fascinating area. These, these creatures that are out there, these Bigfoot that are out there are, uh, they're not used to people because people don't go out in this area other than to four wheel or, you know, uh, hunt that you can hunt out there, but they don't do anything else and they're not out there at night. So, um, they're, they're pretty comfortable out there as opposed to, um, where, 
you know, we used to go in our old place. It was also in a remote, you know, good area. But um, I think there were a, a lot more hikers and campers and things like that that went to the area that we did in our old place. But this one is a, it's a whole different story. And several weeks ago, Bob and I decided to um, go out there. We have a four-wheel drive truck. And I said, you know, we, we had gone out there just a little bit walking. And I said, you know, I really would like to drive out on this road. And it's horrendous, let me tell you. It, it's, not, it's, it's rip the oil pan off your car kind of thing. Um, rocks and and dips and gullies full of water and it's no wonder people like to go out there and you know four wheel up. but um I, I said let's go as far as we can and then you know get out and walk and see really see this inside area and see what's out there and let me tell you man it is there is nothing out there. There's just, like I said, water and rocks and trees and pretty dense. Um, there's some pretty dense tree uh, areas out there. And we must have walked, um, I would have to say at least a mile and a half, maybe two miles in from our vehicle after we drove about a mile in. And we just kept walking and uh, it was starting to get, you know, kind of in that later afternoon, um, air, uh, later afternoon. So we decided to turn around and come back out. But man, I'm telling you, it is, it is perfect for, for, uh, anything to be out there. And I said to Bob, it's no wonder, you know, they're out here. I mean, they have everything that they need and they're pretty secluded. And it also borders, it's not just, you know, it's the Connecticut uh, state line borders the Rhode Island state line. And this thing is just, just woods and just woods. I mean, it's just nothing there. Like I said, I sent the uh, topical to, to Tom for him to look at. And it's, uh, it's pretty remote and it's pretty interesting. And it's a fun place to go to well, it Not, looks like an you, you awesome will. place. I, I I love the fact, you know, we're, Will and I are West Coast uh, kids, if you want to call us that. And I love the fact that on the East Coast with a much higher uh, population density than the West Coast, that you have areas like this. This is fantastic. And that you have the creatures out there. I just, it's, you know, we're going to make it out there one of these days and go out on one of your expeditions. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. I, I'm thanking you guys to come out. I mean, we have we have a guest apartment that you guys can stay in, stay as long as you want. I mean, this place is five miles from where we live. Um, as you know, it's just, it's very close. We have permission, you know, to be there from the owner. Um, he knows that we go up there and he's he's cool about it. He's had activity at his house, um, which is what got us there to begin with. And, <clears throat> you know, he, he talks about it with us and he knows that we're up there. He doesn't care. And again, it's conservation area um, beyond his what he owns. So it's it's amazing. And it's not that far away. And I'm wondering, I'm just wondering, you know, when they're going to gravitate toward you know, our, our area, because our area is pretty wooded and, and, you know, talking about how much woods we have here, you'd be amazed. Look it up. There is so much, even in Massachusetts being just, just a little spit of a state, um, that I used to live in. It's just acres and acres of forest land. Same thing in Connecticut, acres and acres of forest land. You wouldn't think so being so small, but there are there it's it's just vastly covered with you know forest, so it's easy, um, you know, for these things to move around. Easy, I mean, especially in the place that we went and th that we're researching now. I mean, there, there, I have no, 
I have no doubt that they are pretty comfortable here. They're not very comfortable when we come and see them <laughs> because they're not used to they're not used to having us or having people, you know, interrupt their quiet night or whatever it is that they're, you know, doing foraging, whatever they're doing. Um, so well, I don't I think, think it's too great that you. I think you need to keep going out there. You need to keep interrupting them and uh, keep getting recordings and anything else you can get. Listen, both of you guys, we're just about out of time. It's been way too long to have you on the show. Yeah. So we need to get both of you guys back on. That's right. More and regularly. Yes, absolutely. So keep us posted on updates. Well, we need to get both of you guys out here. Absolutely. We'll, we'll right. Absolutely. Yes. You'd be surprised at the activity. Yep. I, I like I mean, it. We used, to be jealous. we used to be jealous of the Northwest. Always. <laughs> oh, oh man, I... I wish I wish I could go to, you know, Bluff Creek. I wish I could go to all these places, but you know, um you'd be amazed and it is amazing when people hear that there are Bigfoot in this area. It, I mean, you just, you know, what Lisa was saying, um it it's it's crazy, especially upstate New York, and, you know. Yeah. But oh, yeah. Yeah. it all it all gravitates. You know, we're up in that corner, we're up in that area. Western Mass, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, all of that area is is just, you know, prime, prime area for these guys. All right, guys. Well, listen, we're out of time. Keep us posted, and we're going to have you back on, on a more regular basis. Absolutely. Thanks for having us again. All right. Thank you, Norma. For Thank you, us. Lisa. All right. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. All right, everyone. No problem. Thanks for listening. In Bigfoot History, Trinity Alps, California, April 1966. Nick Campbell of Pomona told Ken Coon that on April 3rd, arriving at a campsite north of Weaverville, he and friends saw something large and dark run down a very steep bank. That night, something was throwing the trash cans around, and one of the group shone a flashlight under the edge of the tent and saw a Sasquatch, which turned and stared at the light, dropped the can in its hand, turned and walked off. Next day, three miles west of camp, they saw the creature again while eating lunch and spent half an hour playing hide and seek until it finally went away. Several of them saw it. It was seen once more on that trip, raided the trash can two more times, and took some raw bacon and eggs they left out for it. Story from Orleans, California, 1952. This person's encounter was so shocking that he blocked it from consciousness for a time. He did recall the events, however, and this is what he related. I began to remember more and more of what happened. I had me a bad case of the jitters as the memory uncoiled. The first part of the story took me back to 1952, when I had gone to Orleans to start preliminary work on a logging operation with two men by the names of Lee Valeri and Josh Russell. One evening, Josh told me Lee had gone up to Happy Camp, but not having transportation back wanted me to take the Mercury and go up and get him. I had driven the extremely crooked and dangerous road up there, but not being able to find him started back alone to Orleans. It had been raining very heavily, and after going back a few miles, I found there had been a slide across the road. There was a man with a flashlight there who told me I could still go back to Orleans by way of a detour across the river. He said it was a dirt road that went through Bear Valley and could come out at the mouth of Bluff Creek a few miles below Orleans. I had been driving slowly down this road for about 20 miles, I guess, sort of daydreaming when I saw it. Dimly in the headlights, in the rain, was a shaggy, orangutan-like apparition of a human. For an instant, I had the impression the shaggy hair of the creature was a hoary blue-gray in the headlights. An ogre, I remember thinking. But the thing swiftly backpedaled off the road and behind a tree. I automatically passed it off as imagination and drove on by the spot. Suddenly, without warning... 
the car went into a violent and unreasonable skid. I brought the car back under control, but for some reason glanced into the rearview mirror. In the dim light of the taillights and license display bulb, I thought I could see a savage-looking face looking through the rear glass. I continued on, and when I looked again, there was no face. So again concluded it was imagination. I had gone another quarter mile, I guess, when across the road was a small six-inch sapling. I stopped the car and got out, intending to drag it aside if possible. Suddenly I heard the swift thud of flying feet of something coming down the road. Reality was upon me, and I remember cursing myself for not paying attention to what I had previously seen. It was the shaggy, human-like monster I had seen in the headlights. It at once started circling around me, snarling and acting very menacing. It kept this circling up for some time and once came up quite close, and I could see its face reflected by the headlights much better. The eyes were round and rather luminous. The hair on top of its rather low and rounded head was pretty short. Its eye teeth were far longer than a human's. Also the chest and upper part of its torso was rather bare of hair, and also leathery looking. It wasn't too tall, not much more than my own five feet nine inches, although it had a stooped, long-armed posture. Then suddenly it changed tactics. It would stalk off down the road, but would come charging back, like a bat out of hell, when I started toward the car. The hour was late. The thing was becoming more and more menacing, and I was almost paralyzed by this time, paralyzed by fear. Suddenly a plan of escape, born out of desperation, popped into my mind. Since the monster seemed to think I couldn't get away, why not, when it went down the road again, playing cat and mouse, try to get in the car and smash through the sapling? This I did and sprang for the door of the car a dozen feet away, No sooner was I inside when there it was, trying to claw through the window. I jerked the car into gear, floored the accelerator, and can vividly remember the wet sapling glistening whitely in the headlights as the car slashed it aside. I remember the scream of rage and frustration it then gave. It was a curious, trumpeting sound, like the scream of a stallion and the roar of a mad grizzly. The car then felt as though it were being held back by something half-riding and attempting to stop it but the powerful mercury proved too much for it, and after a couple hundred yards I felt no more resistance. To top this unbelievable experience off, believe it or not, I promptly forgot the whole experience. Then and there it went out of my mind. Not even the next day when Lee asked me if I had seen anything unusual on that road last night did I remember. He had come later from Happy Camp with another man hired to take him to Orleans. A few days later... An incident happened that should have brought the experience back, but didn't. Lee noticed a big dent in the grill of the car, and asked me how it got there. I told him I didn't know. Incidentally, Lee told me that something had tried to push them off the road when they came through on the detour. He said there's something strange going on around here, and let the matter drop. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>